Hello, my name is Alexandra Corey, and I'm a third year PhD student working on a critical edition of selected poems by a Renaissance court poet named Emmanuel Philibert de Pangon, who was at the court of Savoy in, in the 16th century. But today I'm going to discuss the evolution of bell sleeves and take a look at representations of this style in contemporary film. The term bell sleeves refers to um, adaptation of the long, loose sleeves uh, worn in the medieval and early modern eras, which carry certain significance with regard to social status, um, also known as trumpet sleeves, the houppelant, the haricot, and other variations on this style. To begin, we must recognize that the size and style of the sleeves were not solely for aesthetic purposes. This is evidenced by sumptuary laws put in place so that only a particular group of people could wear such styles, reserved for the nobility. According to Dr. Palahoti, dress and fashion in early modern Italy were regulated by various formal and informal rules that limited the choice of apparel. Outward appearance was systematically controlled, particularly through sumptuary laws designed to ensure that the social rank of each person would be immediately recognizable. Italian states even went as far as to demand that a household obtain a permit to incorporate these fabrics and styles into their daily attire. The evolution of design also came into play as members of society transgressed sumptuary laws and propagated various styles by altering garments which they already own. Professor Evelyn Welsh observes that, quote, in the early 15th century, the Venetian Senate passed a set of laws under the rubric Pro Manicis Togarum on the sleeves of robes. This limited the size and scale of men and women's sleeves, punishing the tailor as well as the purchaser for any infraction. Much of this debate centered on these voluminous balloon-like sleeves which were officially reserved to the doge alone. When others, particularly women, adopted this fashion, it disrupted a sense of hierarchical order as well as increasing the cost of the garment. Welsh explains how, while sleeves are little studied compared to other early modern indicators of social status, we can determine that there was a rise in consumer demand for luxury textiles such as sleeves during the 15th and 16th centuries. There is also a gendered component which should not be overlooked. While men purchased garments and textiles, women repaired them, and in so doing often made alterations reflecting such trends. Thus, style was not always constricted to the type of consumer relationship that we experience today. Rather, it involved circulation of materials and adaptations of design. Women's sleeves, therefore, provide an important and interesting perspective into the nuances of the relationship between clothing and social status in the early modern period. Sleeves provided a sort of canvas on which to express both social hierarchy and political affiliations. Welsh provides the example of Pisanello's portrait of Ginevra d'Este with the juniper leaves and berries embroidered on her overmantle. She notes that sleeves provided a particularly useful space for signs, as evidenced by the oversleeve worn by a supporter of the Medici and the engraving attributed to Baccio Baldini. The long, flowing sleeves popular in the 15th century are exemplified by such paintings as Joss Toller's St. George Slaying the Dragon. This style eventually developed into the trumpet sleeve worn, for example, by Catherine Parr or Queen Elizabeth in the early 16th century. If we take a closer look at this type of sleeve, we notice an interesting design in which the fabric falls away at the elbow. According to the dress historian Bernadette Banner, the center front seam of the sleeve is left open from hip level. This seems to be a common construction method for the 15th century houppelandes, which the gown in the painting resembles. She references the book Textiles and Clothing, 1150 to 1450, regarding her recreation of the very dress depicted in Haller's St. George Slaying the Dragon, and demonstrates this recreation in a video which one can find on YouTube. While the houppelandes originated in the 13th century, the flared sleeve endured even into the 16th century, in effect, through both medieval and early modern periods. On that note, I would like to turn our attention to a particular rendition of this style of sleeve in contemporary film. 
I have chosen to focus on the Maleficent films as I noticed an interesting phenomenon in which the costume designers Ellen Mirajnik and Oliver Garcia engage in some artic artistic liberty which both recalls the style's original function as a signifier of hierarchy, while also using this style to exhibit attributes of the characters themselves, attributes which ultimately prove significant to the plot of the film. Much like in 15th century Italy, when the sleeve is a canvas on which one could express not only one's social standing, but also one's social and political affiliations, the film uses this type of sleeve in conjunction with other elements of costuming to express the dichotomic, dichotomous politics of the two rival queens. Now, I'm going to break away from history for just a moment to provide a little context for the film for those who haven't seen it. The films are a part of a contemporary Disney media franchise which depicts a fantasy world in which there is a great tension between industrialization and nature. In the most recent film, one character is the Queen of Industry, portrayed by Michelle Pfeiffer, and the other, Maleficent, is the Queen of the Moorlands, the area dominated by nature, portrayed by Angelina Jolie. Maleficent is also a fairy who's physically harmed by the touch of iron, so given the context of the storyline, we're going to take a look at how, <clears throat> how materials were used to facilitate the plot while also hearkening to a medieval and early modern aesthetic. We know that the Industrial Revolution occurred roughly between 1760 and 1840, so we obviously have to engage with some suspension of disbelief to enter this medieval and early modern fantasy world. That said, let us look at the elements of the costuming which are called 16th century. Here you can see a design which resembles the portraits of Catherine Parr and, or the young Queen Elizabeth, uh, which I, I've also shown here with a square neckline, triangular torso, and flared sleeves. While the story exists outside of time, we are invited as viewers to position ourselves in a world which is aesthetically reminiscent of 16th century Europe. Materials from the Industrial Revolution are conjoined, however, with early modern military design. Here we have an iron necklace which recalls the iron production of the Industrial Age, as well as a design which is reminiscent of wrist plates and a pearl necklace which resembles the design of a 16th century armor. Eventually this character initiates battles, uh, well initiates a battle with the Moorlands and that tension is clearly reflected in such industrial and military design. Now let's look at the Queen of the Moorlands. Her costumes reflect her equivalent nobility with a design also reminiscent of the Houpelons rather in a looser style, uh, which resembles even the, the, the 13th century El Ego. The colors are more subdued than the industrial costume with earth tones rather than bright, wider tones. And uh, um, it's interesting because in another scene, one can find elements of the late 16th century with a collar that resembles the silhouette of Elizabethan ruffs worn by Queen Elizabeth later in life. The 15th and 16th centuries are, are more mixed in this costuming as well as, as that of even, even the 13th century how go, as I mentioned. So um, it's interesting because while this character is, um, while, the, while the story itself is, as I mentioned, outside of time and, and it requires suspension of disbelief, one of the characters, the industrial character, is, is human and, and represents monarchy in that sense, whereas the, the fairy character, the non-human character, is perhaps a bit more, even more artistic liberty that the, the costume designers can take in that sense because the, the, the character does not reflect the institution of monarchy in the same way. So they end up mixing 13th century um, Ellie go uh, with with the um, more 15th century Oupelons and then as well as 16th century elements as well in, in her costumes. But this character is clearly positioned as nobility nonetheless and, and also aligned with nature in an opposition to the industrialization personified by her rival. So, 
We see how medieval and early modern garments, including sleeves, are used once again as canvases on which to portray political affiliations, this time, however, in an obviously fantastical and Disney-fied way. But what is the relevance of the era to these films? This requires a look at the fable itself. What we focus on today is a story which is only very loosely based on the original fairy tale yet it nonetheless attempts to acknowledge the era from which it came. In the 1800s, the Brothers Grimm collected and printed the version by Charles Perrault as told in the Histoire ou Contes du Temps Passé in 1697. The original fairy tale, however, dates back to the earliest known version called Le Roman de Perceforet, originating between 1330 and 1344. Disney originally produced an animated version in 1959, However, the legacy of the story itself is quite obviously entrenched in the original time period. So this evolution over the medieval and early modern eras, right? The recent films then use medieval and early modern aesthetics as a template with which to engage with certain anxieties around the, the tension between um, human industry and nature, as we can see in the costumes of these two imagined queens. What then is the responsibility of costuming which reimagines historical design. There's certainly a minimum of elements which reflect the original garment that one must keep, otherwise the design would be totally unrecognizable. But how and when is this line crossed? If not the material, is it the silhouette, the shape of the garment? I will leave you with these questions. Under any circumstance, it is clear that sleeves are, and in many ways have been, used as a canvas on which to depict that which is otherwise invisible to the eye. Thank you.